sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Alex Jimenez is our speaker today. He's been here before, so let's welcome him once again. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Did you eat a good breakfast? No. Yes. <laughs> some said no, some said yes. Some are fasting, some aren't. Either way, praise the Lord, we all made it safely here. Amen? Amen. Amen. This morning, I have to admit, I had some sermons prepared that I have from the past, but there's always that wrestling that what should I speak about? What do people need? Or what does the church need to hear? And so some preachers have sort of likened it to birth pains. Because they say that creating the message and, and so forth is painful. But when you finally deliver the baby, that's the best part. Yeah. And so that's what they're saying about preaching and so forth. And I've never gone through that experience. But just know that it's very stressful <laughs> when you have to put together a message. So pray for me as I speak this morning. And... This morning I want to talk about the Church of Laodicea. Perhaps you've already heard about the Church of Laodicea, or perhaps you're familiar with the seven churches in Revelation, but according to the Bible, don't forget the words of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. He said, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put these things in remembrance, though ye know them and be established in present truth. So even though you may know these things already, my job is to actually remind you of these things. So, true ministers actually remind the church of that which they already know. So, as I speak this morning, once again, please pray for me. And we do ask that the Holy Spirit will be with us this morning. So, before I begin, please kneel with me as far as you are able to. Yes. Lord, once again, we can't thank you enough for bringing us to church this morning, Lord. And there are so many different things that doing at this moment. But for one reason or another, Lord, because of the Holy Spirit, Lord, He has convicted us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgments. And Lord, we know that if it wasn't for you, we would not be here. The very fact that we are sitting in these pews is evidence that the Holy Spirit is working upon our hearts. But oh Lord, let us not resist the work of the Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom and understanding now, Lord, as we begin this morning. I pray that every single person would understand that the message would be clear. And when they leave this building, Lord, they would be able to practically apply this into their lives. Amen. Lord, give us divine focus. Allow us to comprehend what is going to be presented this morning. And Lord, be with me as I speak as well. Mm -hmm. I pray that Alex Jimenez wouldn't be heard. Amen. I pray that you would literally speak through me, Father. Amen. Because if you can use the donkey, you can use me. Amen. So Lord, be with me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's important to understand that the churches of Revelation, the seven churches, were seven literal churches that existed in Asia Minor, which is now known today as, do you know, where Asia Minor now is, or what it's called today? It's Turkey. So those seven churches were actually physically located and were present in that area, Asia Minor. However, each one of these literal physical churches that existed during that time, each church represents a different, different time period or a different era of church history. From the time of the apostles, the first church of Ephesus, all the way into the last church, which is Laodicea. Laodicea. And guess which church we are living in today? Laodicea. We are the church of Laodicea. Now, just know that there are going to be some words in here that perhaps are a little strong in the message, but the best part is the remedy. Because God never presents the condition without giving us a remedy. Amen. And remember, the he tells us what we need to do is evidence that He loves us. Amen. So this morning's message is a very encouraging message. So as we begin, please turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. 
Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Now, does anyone know what the word Laodicea means by definition? It's okay to take a guess. No one wants to take a guess? Laziness. Laziness, okay, that's sort of the condition implied, but what does that actually mean? Kickback. Selfish. Did you say kickback? Yeah. So they're kind of hanging out? Yeah. Okay. Lukewarm. Selfish, lukewarm, okay. Yeah. The word literally means a people adjudged. So that means that this is the church period or church history in which the church is living in the time of the investigative judgment. They're living in this time period where God is beginning to investigate the books, right? The books of those who believe and follow Jesus. The books are being examined. So this is the church that is living during that time period from 1844 and on. Does that make sense? Amen. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Notice what the Bible says here. And unto the church... Uh, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans writes, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Why does Jesus introduce himself as the faithful and true witness? Any ideas? Is he faithful? Amen. He is faithful, right? Amen. What verses come to mind when you think of the faithful or the true witness? Do any verses come to mind? I know there's probably, someone's probably has some verses, but they're a little scared to answer. Okay? For a faith that we say to, uh, that one is in, in Romans uh, 10, 9, and 10. You know. Okay, good. What else? Ephesians 8, 9, and 10. But for a gracious thing to faith, not out of yourselves, give to God, not as works, but as any man should both. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Amen. So believing in the promise, uh -huh. having faith in the gift, right? What else? God is so faithful that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. So he can help you with the temptation, right? So God is faithful. But let's look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 5. I hope that you're okay with turning back and forth in between the Bible. After all, you don't want to hear my interpretation. You want to know what the Bible has to say, amen? amen. So Proverbs chapter 14, let's go to verse 5. And then we will read verse 25. And when you arrive, please say amen. Amen. Bible says here, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Verse 25, a true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Mm. So the reason why Jesus is introduced as a faithful and true witness in the church of Laodicea is because Jesus does not lie. Amen. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because if God tells us something in his word, we can trust him. Because if he said something and it didn't come to pass, that would make God a what? Liar. So the Bible is telling us, look, place your confidence in Jesus. He is a faithful and a true witness. You don't need to fear. No matter what the condition is, just know that Jesus is faithful. And it even says that he is also the faithful and a true witness because he delivers souls. He can deliver us from the bondage of sin. Let's go to... John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We're going to examine another part of the verse here in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. We're going to go to first, or sorry, not first John, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Notice it says here that he's introduced as the beginning or the creation of God. Mm -hmm. Now that can be understood two different ways. Either Jesus was a created being, which I don't believe, I believe he's eternal, Amen. the beginning until the end. Or it can be understood that he has a, something to do with creation, that he played a role in creation. I believe it's the second one, that Jesus actually had a role in creation. He actually, by him, the worlds were made. And you can read about that in Hebrews chapter 1. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, we see from here, from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. 
So here we clearly see, number one, that Jesus is God, and by him, what was created? Everything. Everything was created by Jesus. Some people say Jesus was begotten. It's clear from Scripture, from what I believe, that Jesus has always been eternal. From the beginning all the way until the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. Amen. Now, why is he introduced as the Creator? We know that he is the Creator, but why is he introduced as the Creator? It's important to consider that this is the last church prior to the second coming of Jesus. Not a literal church, spiritually. Do we understand that? Amen. This is not a literal church we're talking about. Spiritually, this represents the condition of the church, the, the church almost worldwide. All those who claim to follow Jesus, there is a very small remnant within that church that is actually living up to the light that God has given them. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, we'll read verses 3. Through five. Second Peter chapter three verses three through five. Now, how much time do I have before I have to end? Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes? Yes. Okay, that is good. So I have to end by from thirty minutes perfect. now until then? Okay, yeah. perfect. So twelve oh five, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Let's do that. <laughs> By the way, just know that I rarely go past 35 to 40 minutes. So if I do go past a little, just know that I'm definitely not going over for an hour, over 45 minutes. Because I know people are hungry and I'm hungry as well. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Are we there? Amen. And knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So Jesus here is introducing himself as the creator because there's sort of a group of people that seem to doubt. And Jesus is letting them know, hey listen, this is the last church. You may doubt whether or not I'm coming back. And some people doubt, but just know that I am coming back. Amen. So when people say, hey, you know what people have been saying? Jesus is going to come up until this time, and you know, he hasn't come. That's evidence that he is about to come because they are fulfilling the prophecy. Amen. So the fact that people say that is evidence that he is about to come. That's right. <laughs> now, Jesus also tells us here, because he is the one speaking in Revelation chapter 3. Let's go back there. Revelation chapter 3, let's go to verse 15 now. So keep your finger in Revelation chapter 3 as we turn back and forth. I should have mentioned that earlier because we're going to be back and forth. But notice here that it says that he knows their works, that they are neither cold nor hot. Interesting to consider the fact that in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12, we see that the Bible tells us, because lawlessness abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. So I don't believe this is to say that Jesus is literally saying that, look, I want you to be cold completely in sin because I don't think God wants anyone to be in sin. I just think it's basically God letting the church know that they should make a decision whether or not they want to serve us is going to spew them out of their mouth. That means that their name is not in his mouth so that he can confess it before the Father. So what do you think it means when he says he's going to spew them out of his mouth? I know it's strong language. Not going to match with him anymore. Or could it possibly mean that he's going to just cut off their salvation? Do away with them. Yeah, he's not going to be bothered with them anymore. I mean, God forbid that should ever happen. Just know that is very difficult to do with God. God is going to do everything in His power to make sure that you and I are saved at last when Jesus comes back. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Everything that he possibly can, if it wasn't for the loving kindness of God and his mercy, no one would be here this morning. Right. So just know it is very hard for God to give up on us. Mm -hmm. But God, listen, he's a gentleman. Yes. There comes a point in time where God says, hey, look, I want to see you happy. If that is what makes you happy and you think that you're better off there, just know that I'm going to leave you alone. So this is not God being vindictive or judgmental or, or indifferent to the needs of his people. It's simply God saying, hey, listen, at the end of the day, I just want you to do what makes you happy. Right. 
If that makes you happy, then go ahead and choose that. But just know I'm always available. But at the same time, there's going to be a point in time where it just might be too late. Now, friends, God doesn't want us to live our life in fear. Is that clear? Some people preach, oh, you know, just give your life to God today because you don't know if tomorrow's promised. And it's true. Tomorrow's not promised. I mean, God forbid it should happen. But the reality is that we can go on our car today, start driving, and something unfortunate can happen. But God doesn't want us to live our life in fear. Right? Because... He will keep thee in perfect peace whose might has stayed upon thee. Amen. So God wants us to have confidence in Him, yes. to trust in Him. Mm-hmm. But God is looking to draw us through His love. Yes. Yes. And we're going to find out about that at the end of the, this epistle, this letter. Verse 17, are we there? Yes. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, mm-hmm. and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, the church literally thinks they have nothing that they need. They actually think they're okay. They don't see their need. And God is literally presenting their condition before them. And even while he's presenting it to them, they think, you know what, we're fine. Now, I'm going to give you sort of a brief experience of mine. But this is how I've come to sort of examine myself, my Christian experience, which is incorrect, by the way. I sort of tend to think, you know what, every now and then I speak at churches, and well, I come to church, I pay my tithes, and I mean, I I guess I'm doing good, because you sort of compare yourself with others, naturally, that's just what we do. Mm -hmm. But when you realize that we should examine ourselves, as Paul talks about, you realize, you know what, there's some areas in my life that I need to work on with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we realize, you know what, we're kind of far from God, but guess what, we can come back at any time. And He is there for us. Amen? Amen. What does it mean to be wretched? Can anyone think of a verse in the Bible that mentions the word wretched? Uh, You said it. Romans 7. Romans 7, 24. Let's go there. Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. Are we still awake this morning? Amen. Okay, good. (laughs) Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. This is Paul describing his condition, sometimes the difficulties that the Christian experiences, even within his walk, even while he's walking with God. Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. Are we there? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Have you ever tried doing that which is right? And find yourself doing that which is wrong? That's what it means to be wretched. So the church of Laodicea is literally wretched. They're trying to do that which is right, but they just don't have the necessary power to do that which is correct. And so God is letting this know. God is letting them know this, that they need Him in order to continue and be faithful. What does it mean to be miserable? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. Oh boy, time goes by so fast when you're up here. I just realized that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. Mm -hmm. To be miserable is to think that we are going to spend an eternity with Jesus when we don't even have a relationship with Him. And that's what the Bible is telling us. It's telling us, look, (coughs) this is what it means to actually lack faith, to not actually have hope in Christ. That's what it means to be miserable. Now, what does it mean to be poor? Now, you can write this one down for time's sake, but you can actually... Go to the verse in James chapter 2 and verse 5, and you'll see that actually to be poor is not a reference to that which is literal, but sort of a dead, dead form of spirituality within the church. A people that are sort of indifferent, that don't really have that experience that is necessary with Jesus. They are poor in faith 
And because they are poor in faith, they don't have the love that God requires of them. Now, notice that it mentions that they lack faith, right? The church of Laodicea lacks faith. That's obviously pretty evident. Now, what does the Bible tell us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17? Does anyone know what that says? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing and hearing. hearing by the word of God. So what do you think Laodicea needs? If we cultivate our faith by reading the word of God, what do you think the church of Laodicea needs? The word of God. They need the word of God, right? It's not rocket science. It's simple. They need the word of God. Yes. Because the word of God gives us power. Yes. It gives us fire yes. to do evangelism, to pray, to witness, to come to church. And without the Holy Spirit, the word of God. Amen. What does it mean to be blind? Let's go to John chapter 9 and verse 41. John chapter 9 and verse 41. Say amen when we arrive. Amen. Amen. Now we need to get there a little bit more quickly, okay? Because we are a little short on time. Jesus says, if you were blind, ye should have what? No sin. No sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So literally, to be blind is to say, you know what? I'm doing great spiritually. The moment you say that, you're blind. Because you think there's no more room for growth. You think, you know what, I've reached the top. And so when you think like that, there's no more room for growth. So he's saying, look, I want to take you to the next level. Yes. I can take you there. Amen. But you have to be willing. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, what does it mean to be naked? Write this one down. We're not going to go there for time's sake. This is a beautiful one. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 4 through 8, and in verse 36, we see that it describes God's people as naked prior to the covenant that God made with them. They were in sin. They were doing things that clearly did not please God. And God found them in their condition and literally picked them up and took them in. It doesn't matter what the condition is, friends. What matters is do we actually want to be fixed or not? Because if we are willing, God is willing. You see, some people just say, oh, you know, God does everything. God does everything. And it's true. Without God, we can't do anything. But notice what it says in Philippians 2.13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to, will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. So number one, God works in us. But guess what? We have the choice. Yeah. So while God can work all that he possibly wants to, at the end of the day, we have the choice to say, you know what, yes or no. Amen. And that's what makes this thing so difficult sometimes. Now, let's go ahead and go back to Revelation chapter 3. Recall, I, do, I did tell you now to put your finger there because we are going back and forth. But let's go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. We're going to get to the best part, which is the remedy. Sometimes the condition hurts. Yeah. But we need to hear it. But the best part is the remedy. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. The Bible tells us, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiments, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesaf, that thou mayest see. You know what the beautiful thing is? As I mentioned earlier, excuse me, God is a gentleman. He doesn't force anyone. Amen. He gives us suggestions. Even the Ten Commandments are not really commandments. Yes, that's what God tells us to do, but I like to think of them as Ten Promises. Yes. Because guess what? If this morning you lie, you can say, Father, forgive me, I lie. But by faith, the commandment says, thou shalt not lie. I have faith in the commandment. And because you gave it, that's evidence that I can keep it. 
True. They're promises, not so much commandments. Amen. And as Adventists, it's very easy to see them as commandments. But what I like to say is Jesus' letter here is a simple suggestion. Yes. But this suggestion has eternal consequences. Yes. Does that make sense? Amen. So what is the fire? What is the fire? What is this gold? What is, what is this the Bible is talking about? You know, the gold is really not that difficult to receive. In fact, let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 3. I told you we were going to be going back and forth. I think that's okay with you, though, right? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend your money on that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You see, the gold, it's free. Amen. No price. But there's a problem. Sometimes we don't want to come to get the gold. True. But it's very simple. In fact, when I was a Bible worker in Southern California area, I'll never forget, we were knocking on doors, my friends and I, and the leader, the canvassing leader came by, and her name was Heidi, and she told us, we're actually going to go out to eat Thai food. Now, I was on a budget, so I wasn't so happy about that because I told my friend, hey, Tim, man, we're going to get Thai food? I'm trying to spend like $10 a week on food, man. I don't know if I can do it. He said, it's fine, man. God will provide. We're going to go to our door. We'll be fine. And then we got in the car. And we're driving over to the Thai place. And they're all talking, I'm going to get Pat's new, drunken noodle, fried rice. And I'm thinking, I don't want any of that. I just want to save my money. <laughs> but then I hear the words from Heidi. She says, guys, everything is paid for. Amen. Order whatever you want. So I'm thinking, all right. I don't care anymore. I love Thai food. I don't care. I don't have to pay. It's free. I just have to come. Friends, it's that simple. Amen. But the question is, are you going to go? Yes. Will you receive that gold? Yes. Now, let's get a little bit further into the gold. Let's go to 1 Peter 1.7. What is the gold? 1 Peter 1.7. 1 Peter 1.7. This is what the gold actually represents. 1 Peter 1 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. The gold is faith. Yeah. It's very simple. But Laodicea, they lack faith as we examined earlier. Yes. And the reason why they lack faith is because they are not spending time in this. Amen. Yes. They have neglected the word of God. <laughs> so how can you have faith if you are neglecting this? It's very easy to have our face in Facebook, but the question is, are we having our face in this book? Hmm. Yeah. We need to have our face in this book. This is the most yes. important book for this time, friends. Yes. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Laodicea, they need the word of God. That's the first remedy. If you're taking notes, write that down. Laodicea needs the word of God. Now, faith needs a fuel. Faith needs something to function. It needs love. Yes. Yes. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> For in Jesus Christ, 
Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Friends, it's very simple. If you don't know God, you don't trust God. If you don't trust God, then you don't love God. That's the order. You would never go on a trip with someone that you don't know. If someone said, hey, let's go to Germany on a vacation, and you just met them two minutes ago, you're going to be like, what in the world? Why would I do that? I don't know that person. But when you get to know that person, and if you become friends, then it's a little bit more different now. This is why, well, sometimes we think, why can't God allow everyone into the kingdom of heaven? It's not that he doesn't want them to come, but the reality is that some people would be uncomfortable with the environment. Yes. It's different. People that are going to be in heaven will be people that love Jesus, that had faith. Amen. If God would allow someone to be there, they couldn't even be happy. Right. So God is actually merciful by performing that act and not allowing some people to come to heaven. Amen. He's just simply saying, hey, that's what you wanted? You can go ahead and have it your way. It's that simple. And friends, why do we love God? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. Amen. It's very simple. Amen. You see, while we were in our sins, while we were doing things that displeased God, when we didn't love God, when we thought we would never come to God, God said, you know what? It's worth it. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to leave all that I have up there. Everything. I'm coming down and I'm going to die for a group of people that might not love me. And friends, sometimes we doubt the love of God. We should never doubt the love of God. If you were in jail, and let's suppose that the bail was set for $50,000. A friend came and he said, hey, I want to bail you out of jail. I will pay $50,000. Let's say that you didn't believe that person, but a week later, you're bailed out for $50,000. Would you question that person's love for you? No. You would not. Why? Because he, put his because he paid $50,000. Friends, on the cross of Calvary, there was no price. Yeah. You cannot place a price on someone on what their value is. Yeah. It's impossible. He would have done it even for just one person. True. Can you imagine from the time of Adam up until the end of time over here, Jesus said, hey, you know what? If one person accepts, it's worth it. Yeah. One person, yes. it's worth it. Yes. Man, that's crazy. What is a white garment? Well, don't turn there, but in Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, the white garment represents righteousness. Laodicea lacks righteousness. Mm -hmm. And we see that in 1888, even Jesus didn't come because they neglected the message of righteousness by faith. True. And that's truly the reason why he has not returned today. Yes. We need that same message. A faith that works by love. Yes. Yes. An entire yes. change of the hearts. Yes. You see, but our righteousness, according to Isaiah 64, 6, don't turn there, is as filthy rags. We have no righteousness of ourselves. Right. So we need the righteousness of God. Yes. And we see that God is our righteousness. Yes. The last thing we will examine, what is the ISAP? Don't turn it with me, write this down. In Ephesians 1, verse 17 and 18, it says that the ISAP is the Holy Spirit. Yes. So number one, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and verse 18. Number one, Laodicea needs the word of God. Number two, they need the Holy Spirit because remember, they are blind. Right. Without the Holy Spirit, they can't see their condition. Right. So they need the Holy Spirit. Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Yes. Even though... God tells them this. He still loves them. You know, I read this morning in my personal devotion, it said that when Jesus spent that last supper, that last meal with his disciples, and they were fighting and bickering about who would be the greatest, he had the mind of a servant. And it says that he loved them until death. 
In other words, he was willing to love them up until the cross, and he would do everything that he possibly could to make sure that he would love them forever. Amen. He has an eternal love for us. And then we will read these two verses and conclude. Behold, I stand and knock at the door. And knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This verse is profound because it seems like he's simply suggesting that if he comes in, he's simply going to eat with us. But if you look at the actual definition of that word sup, it actually means fellowship. So Jesus actually wants to come in and spend time with us. Amen. Personal devotions, amen? amen? In the morning when we wake up, God wants to spend time with us. Yes. A personal relationship with God, that's what he wants. Because as Pastor Alvin says, he says this, right? Corporate worship is not enough. No. We need our own experience with Jesus. Yes. Our own personal and ex yes. experience with Jesus. Verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. Ellen White says that there's ample, ample provision for everyone to be saved, and God has given the power to every person so that they can actually be saved from any sin. Amen. Friends, that's good news. Amen. This morning, my appeal is very simple. How many of you want the Word of God in your lives? Amen. Not just to simply have it there, but to actually read it, to study, yes. to meditate on the beautiful promises. And how many of you want to say, Lord, by your ears and hands, I want the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want the ISAF. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, what a beautiful message Amen. of what you desire to give us. Lord, it would be such a hopeless, hopeless condition if you simply gave us the condition without a remedy. But Lord, the fact that you present the remedy is evidence that if we take that remedy by faith, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, yes. we can be living, thriving, and dynamic Christians. Amen. So Lord, I pray that you would bless every single person here under the sound of my voice. That they wouldn't just believe that Jesus died for the world, but that he actually died for them personally and individually. Yes. Lord, if we are found in a place where perhaps we may have no hope, let us never forget the precious sacrifice that was made for us on the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Over 2,000 years ago, Lord, but the blood is still crying out. We see that, Lord, when Cain, when he slew Abel, Abel's blood, it simply cried for vengeance. Lord, but the blood of Jesus cries for mercy. Amen. And Hebrews 12, 24 tells us that it's a better sacrifice than that of Abel. Mm -hmm. So Lord, I pray that we would truly accept and not neglect the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. Lord, use us in your service. And I pray that even though we are growing in our personal experience with you, that we would never think that we've ever arrived. Amen. Help us to always remember Amen that there is always room for growth as long as Amen. we do. Amen. And when Jesus comes back for the second time, Lord, whether we be found dead or alive, I pray that if we're dead, that we'd be raised up for the true resurrection, Lord, the one that you want us to be a part of, that we can see Jesus face to face. And Lord, I pray that no one would experience a second death. Not one person, Lord. And if we're alive, may we say the words, Lo, this is our God. For whom we have believed. Thank you, Jesus. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.